concept. And I think that's where the, the NDEers are today. We are um, just, it's assumed that uh, it, it's, it's explainable. It's, it's oxygen deprivation or, um, I'm sorry, I'm all, <laughs> I'm not a speaker. Um, but uh, I, I, I feel a kinship with the platypus duck because um, we, they're taking cheers to us. They're picking apart the story and they're trying to uh, uh, break it down to the atom, the, the basic part. They're, they're splitting it apart and the scientists are very methodical in their procedures and they're destroying the whole, which is the whole story of the, the experience. Um, it's about unity. It's about how we're all one and breaking it down to its tiniest parts won't explain the immense vastness of the infinite story that they have to share. Um, in any case, <laughs> sorry, I'm back to square one. Um, so that's where I come from. Um, I'm, uh, I had a very structured upbringing and my uh, family was very set in, in their perception of how things were. Um, I'm the fourth child. Uh, my elder brother is uh, paranoid schizophrenic. We discovered that about 20 years ago. Um, he uh, was put on medication when it was discovered, and um, the uh, uh, medication worked, but it's kind of a balancing act. Um, and uh, so we, we all just kind of learned to, to give him uh, space, basically. Um, the uh, story proper actually begins uh, in 1995. Uh, I was sleeping late on my day off in uh, October, and it was Friday the 13th, uh, coincidentally. And uh, my uh, brother came and knocked on my door and uh, asked me for a cigarette. And I told them that I was sleeping late as my day off and come back later and I'll give them one. And they, and he apparently uh, took that for an answer and left, but about 10 minutes later I woke up and he was standing over me with a knife. And as I opened my eyes, I sensed somebody was there and I opened my eyes and he was standing over me with a knife that I bought for the Renaissance Fair, a double-edged 18-inch dagger that um, was actually coming down at the time. And it was just complete shock. And I grabbed at it out of um, just reflex. I saw it coming down as I was opening my eyes. And I grabbed it and uh, managed to slow it down. And it uh, pierced my chest. And I struggled with him with it. And it actually angled upward because the sternum had stopped it. It angled up into my shoulder and, and pierced through the nerve plexus in my shoulder. Um, I managed to pull it back out, but due to a superior position over me, I was and I just woke up. Um, I uh, just basically slowed him down. Um, he actually stabbed me a total of four times, twice in the chest, once in the arm, and once in the leg. Um, I was just in a complete shock. I was in panic. It actually took me a matter of seconds before, I mean, the pain probably is what drove it home, so to speak. But uh, I, I thought I was dreaming at first when I, when I came to. And um, I was just completely beside myself. I didn't know what was happening. And uh, I just kept saying, oh my god, you're stabbing me. I can't believe you're stabbing me. And it was just instant shock. Um, my. Uh, Mother came because she'd heard the commotion. And uh, she came in the room and uh, reprimanded us for fighting, both of us. And uh, <laughs> the, uh, I'm, oh, I'm sorry, I'm t I was 23 at the time. Um, like I say, it was my day off. I was living at home. Um, uh, California is really hard to live on your own out there. But I was living at home and um, she came in and she reprimanded us for fighting and I think, I don't, she swears that um, she thought he was strangling me at the time. So I think shock had set in with her as soon as she saw the blood. She knew something was wrong, but it didn't process for her. And she went running down the hall and uh, to get help 
presumably she yelled out for my sister to get on uh, 911. And uh, so the theoretically the ambulance was on its way. Um, I, when she came in the room, he stopped. It was like uh, somebody hit an off switch. His arms fell to his sides. He was still gripping the knife, but he had just a blank stare in his eyes. And it's like he wasn't even in there anymore. And the autopilot turned off. And he just stood there and his arms fell to his sides. And I just took my opportunity to get out of the room. Um, and I turned, ran down the hall, and out into the kitchen. As I'm heading down the hall, my mother is running back toward me down the hall. And I thought, okay, she's going to help me. And she actually passed me, almost like she didn't see me, and just passed me in the hallway and ran past me. I'm like, okay, I'm not sure where she's going, but she's going into danger, but I can't help her now anyway. So I uh, continued down the hall and came out into the kitchen where my younger sister was on, nine, uh, on the phone with 911. And um, the, uh, she told me, get on the floor, raise your legs. And we had ceramic tile floor in the kitchen. And I was just wearing a pair of shorts. I had just woken up. And I'm laying on cold ceramic tile floor. And I was bleeding from the chest. I mean, it was a hose of blood. And I, I, and I was holding it in myself. And I was uh, physically struggling to survive. And, um, and the whole time feeling like it was a dream. Um, and uh, so she told me to lay down on the floor. And I. Just, I remember the, the feeling of the warmth on my back as the blood actually cooled down. Mm -hmm. And um, the whole scene just, it took a very surreal aspect as I'm laying on my back and staring at the kitchen ceiling. I see my mother come running back down into the kitchen and I thought she was coming to help now. And uh, it took me a moment to realize she'd actually come out with the knife. She got the knife from her. But she didn't come to help. She went over and started washing the knife. The shock had set in. <laughs> And um, she, she was dealing with the shock in her own way. She was trying to get rid of what had caused the problem and not dealing with the problem that had manifested from it. Um, so I, I called to her, and, and she came, grabbed a kitchen towel from the counter and came over to help. And putting the kitchen towel on my chest, she helped me keep the blood in. And uh, it took a few minutes for the paramedics to arrive. It, uh, it, it seemed like an eternity. Um, laying shivering on the kitchen floor. And uh, when they showed up, I thought, OK, great. I can finally give in. I can finally just let it go. It's in somebody else's hands now. And they started asking me about food allergies. I said, do you have any allergies? I said, well, no. I, 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 antibiotics are fine, whatever. Just can we get to the hospital? Do you have any allergies at all? Well, I'm allergic to green peppers and oranges, but aside from that, can, can we go? And they had a checklist, and they were just going through a routine. They had their own procedure, and I was not going to get in the way of that. Um, it was very surreal. Um, they uh, eventually finished their checklist and loaded me into a, a gurney and brought me out to the ambulance. But the whole time, as they were bringing me out, I realized they don't, the, the reason why they didn't, weren't in shock was because they didn't see how much blood I'd lost in my bedroom down the hall, and it wasn't until I got to the kitchen that it started pooling. They don't realize how bad off I am. They don't realize I'm as good as dead already. And it was at that point, as they were loading me into the ambulance, that I realized I'm not going to make it. Um, the, uh, as that came over me, it was actually liberating. It was a piece set over me, and it was still out of my hands, as I'd already given it over to them. but. At first, the, the, the fear just turned to peace. And it felt, OK, this is it. I can't argue with however it's going to happen. It's going to happen. Um, and it's just my time. And I gave up to that. And uh, uh, the adrenaline was still working in me, though. So as they were rushing me off to the hospital, I was arguing with the paramedics as they're just yelling out blood pressure to the driver. And, and they're trying to gauge how I'm doing. And I kept interrupting and saying, just slow down. Turn off the lights. You're going to get into an accident. I don't want my last minutes in this world to, to cause a pain to anybody. And I, I, I had totally signed up at that point. I was I was phoning in the last few minutes of my existence as far as I was concerned. And uh, 
But uh, even giving up, I, I say conscious. Um, they brought me into the intensive care ward. They actually went a little out of their way and bring me to the nearest hospital because they brought me to one that had a trauma center. And they figured that would improve the chances, um, which apparently it did. Um, <laughs> they, uh, they, they rushed me into the, into the operating room. They got me on a, on a surgery table. And uh, I was just surrounded by a maelstrom. And again, I, I'd given up. and I. I was just a bit of flotsam that was the focus of all their attention, but they were all focused on the body and they were focusing on um, their tasks at hand and what it is they had to do to save this body. And it was, like I say, very surreal. It felt like I was alone in that room in spite of the fact that there were eight other people and they're all running around touching me, putting tubes in me. I mean, they found new openings where <laughs> tubes just don't belong. And they, uh, I had two chest tubes and, um, oh, I won't go through the list. It was, um, I don't recommend it. Uh, the, uh, The uh, maelstrom was just, I felt like I was just in the eye of a hurricane. There was just so much going on around me, and yet I was completely disconnected from it. I was, um, the, the, the single point that was just not moving, and just chaos was happening all around me. And uh, I remember them, uh, at one point they were shoving in a chest tube, and the technician, which is something you never want to hear in a trauma surgery, is oops. Turn it around, put it in the correct way. And I mean, I was conscious for all of it. And you know, it's not just conscious. I was. Um, they kept saying he's still with us. He's he, because they, I guess they finally realized how much blood I'd lost. They said he's still here. He's still with us. Yeah, he's still alive. No, he's still conscious. They were amazed by it. And uh, I can't figure out why because I wasn't even fighting at that. Point. I felt like I had, um, as far as I was concerned, I was already dead. And I felt like, uh, it, it was like they were seeing me still being conscious and were just in completely, complete disbelief with it. Um, the, uh, at, at some point there's either possibly blood loss or maybe they finally drug me to knock me out. But uh, I eventually lost consciousness there. The next thing I was aware of in the chronological timeline was coming to in the intensive care ward. I heard beeping. It was in a dark room. It was about 12 hours later. Um, and I was hooked up to machines and the flashing lights and the beeping. And it was, again, it was like I was dreaming again. I didn't know where I was. And I realized I was alive. And I became angry. And I didn't know why. I didn't. Ex I don't. I didn't at that time remember my experience. It actually came to me a few days later. But at that point, I was angry. I felt betrayed, and I felt hurt, and uh, as though I was rejected. And it didn't make sense to me at the time. And um, it, it was just at that point was the first point where I no longer was worried about dying. Now I'm afraid that I'm going insane. Um, I couldn't understand my own emotions. Um, the uh, trauma, not trauma, the intensive care nurse, uh, probably summoned by the machines, came in a little while after I'd come to, maybe a minute or two, and uh, informed me that I'd actually died twice on the table as they were trying to resuscitate me. Um, I died a second time, and nobody, she said that they were amazed when they finally stabilized me because nobody in there was expecting me to survive. Um, they uh, fought for quite a while, apparently, before they managed to get me out at a point where they could move me into the intensive care ward. Um, the, uh, the, the look in her eyes when I came to, I don't even sure if they were expecting me to become conscious anytime soon, but uh, the, she was beside herself with the, the, the outcome. And I realized that she was voicing what a lot of the nurses on staff, the doctors would never tell you. <laughs> the nurses will tell you when they're surprised. Doctors are God.
Uh, <laughs> I shouldn't say that in a hospital, should I? <laughs> Power's going out. Um, the, uh, the next few days I had clergy come in. I had uh, last rites. I had uh, very close family friends that were escorted in from my fa with my family. And the family members would come in. And a few people asked me, uh, my brother-in-law was one, uh, asked me, did you, do you remember anything when you were dead? And I said, no, I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. And the whole idea of NDEs was so alien to me, I'd never even given it any thought in my life, because again, I was Catholic. I had to follow the Catholic line, and, and everything was already planned out. I did, I'd never had to even question it. Um, if I wanted to know what to think about it, I just had to ask. But uh, <laughs> uh, nothing against Catholicism, because it's a great religion, and I, I still feel great kinship to it. And, but in any case, no judgment. Um, the uh, when I was having visitors coming in for the first few days, and I was only conscious for maybe three out of every twenty-four hours. I was so heavily uh, medicated; I had a constant morphine drip, and. Uh, wasn't eating or anything else at that point, and uh, so the, the dream state just continued. It expanded, and it was uh, within those first three days that a friend of mine, who is a very good friend, a very aggressive young man, who um, had his own view of the way the world works, said, of course you're angry, when I shared my feelings with him. He said, of course you felt betrayed. Of course you felt hurt. Your brother, it just makes perfect sense. I'd be angry too. Your, your brother's gonna gonna wish that uh, he finished the job. As far as I'm concerned, I'm gonna. They, they better. The police better not release him because I'm gonna deal with him if, if they do. And it, I mean, this is the type of friends I had at the time. Um, <laughs> doesn't speak well for me either. Um, but uh, he gave me an excuse, and I took it because nothing else made sense. It was that or accept the fact that. I'm missing a huge piece of the puzzle or I'm crazy. Because I couldn't understand why I felt such betrayal and such hurt. It didn't feel right though. I, I didn't feel like it was attached to my brother. It felt bigger than that and I didn't understand. Um, I uh, continued through my my stay there. In three days they sent me out of the intensive care ward and sent me to the regular ward. Um, a few days after that, some friends from work heard that I was getting regular visitors now and started coming in, and so a whole new wave of uh, well-wishers came and, and came to look at the body. And I, I got the impression, none of them, when they said, said how are you doing? I, I, I learned from experience to just give them answers like, well, the doctor says my blood, my white cell count is going up, I'm working on my incentive spirometer, and I'm going to have less trouble breathing soon, and I'm talking about physical descriptions, and I'm talking about how my body's doing, and it, that's what they were asking for, and I gave them that answer, and, and they moved on, and uh, another visitor would come in, and finally a friend of mine from work came, and she came, and she asked me how I was doing, and I started in with my rehearsed spiel, started talking about my white cell count, she said, no, 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 she interrupted me, she said, how are you doing, and I realized she was looking at me but with death. She was looking into my eyes, and it was kind of mesmerizing. As I looked back into her eyes, I realized she was talking to me, not my body. And as I was starting to grasp that, the reaction had already kicked in, and I said, well, my brother's going to wish that he finished the job when I get out of here. And um, meaning I was going to go, I, I basically following my friend's script. And uh, she looked at me aghast and she said, I cannot believe that I'm hearing this. This is not the Steve I know. Cut. At that point, as I was looking into her eyes and she said, this is not the Steve I know, it was like somebody turned on a fire hose. It, this is six days after I had actually died. I sent, spent those six days half conscious or angry, and I didn't know why. And suddenly the answer came to me in a torrent. I couldn't take it all in, it was coming in so fast. And all the memories of my NDE 
came through at that point. And I realized why I was angry. I was on heaven's doorstep. I was standing in perfect beauty and perfect perfection. And I was sent back. And it, it was a, a wound far deeper than anything of my flesh. It was beyond what I was struggling with. And it hit me to the core. And it all made sense. I knew why I was angry. Um, I didn't have time to dwell on it, though, because this flood came rushing into me as I remembered my experience. And it all took about two seconds, perhaps, best guess, um, in our time, in physical time. It, lasted about two seconds. Um, and it was like somebody blindsided me. It felt like somebody tackled me from the side and I didn't see it coming. But I was looking into her eyes as she said, this is not the Steve I know. And even those words resonate with me still to this day. I'll never forget that exact phrase, that quote, because it wasn't the Steve, whether or not she knew him. That wasn't who I was. That wasn't why I was angry, and that wasn't what I was hurt about. I wasn't hurt about my body. My body was completely immaterial at that point, so to speak. Um, the experience came flooding back, and I think she probably noticed it because I just had a spaced look in my eye, and we wrapped up the conversation, and I only remember how it ended, but she eventually left because I was just trying to soak it in what had come through to me in, that, in those two seconds. And um, I need water. <laughs> it's uh, the experience itself is actually, it's, it's transcendental, it's existential, and it's completely minimalist in nature. I had an experience that, it, best I can say, is an exercise in duality. Um, as it came flooding back in, I the, putting it again back in context, I'd lost consciousness on the operating table. They were struggling to, to keep me alive, and next thing I know, black. I saw nothing. and. The next thing I was aware of was the blackness was still there, but I was aware of it. And I looked around and realized there's no point in turning because I could see 360 degrees all around my body. But I didn't have a body. I was just a point of awareness. And I could see all the way around me, above and below. I had no center. I had no front. I had no dimension whatsoever. I was just a point in space. The space itself was more vast than the three dimensions we're used to here. Um, I couldn't even begin to count them. It was, uh, it was like a barrel. We think of a space, but the barrel had no bottom. It had a depth that just kept going and going. Um, but it was just complete blackness all around me, and the darkness was um, people say oh, it's, it's a dark NDE and they talk about the negative NDEs or the frightening NDEs or whatever label you want to put on it. This was the most beautiful experience in my entire existence that I am aware of. I don't know if I had any before my life, but, but it was in darkness. And it's, it's not a judgment or anything else. It's just that's what it was. It was without form and void. It was completely lacking in anything aside from the darkness myself and infinite love. I was spinning I, well, without moving. I was feeling like I had no point of reference. Um, and I had no body. There was no mention of, there was no meaning to scale. There was no meaning to color or shape because there was no color or shape. It was just infinite blackness. And it was disturbing at first. But the thing that balanced it was the love. The love that I felt in that moment of eternity was so perfect. And the love was completely unconditional. And 
it was more than I could possibly take in, but yet I took it in. And it was directed at me, and it was coming from the other awareness that was there. The best I can describe what I was, I wasn't even a mind. I was a point of awareness. A mind has thoughts, a mind has the manifestations of the ego. The mind has so many things that we're so familiar with here, but what I was was my raw essence there. It was beyond what we assume is our mind even. Um, but I was still myself. I still had my history. I still had my uh, my personality. And uh, it was, when you, not only did I not have a body, my own identity was stripped from me at that point. I still had my personality and I still had my history, but what I thought I was wasn't there. It wasn't along for the ride, but yet there I was. It was, uh, again, very disorienting. Um, the space itself was disorienting and, and the environment was disorienting. Uh, but that love was what held through because it was constant and it was coming from all directions and it was unconditional. I didn't have a life review per se. I didn't have a tunnel. I didn't have a life review, or at least that I remember uh, when I came to in that, uh, what I call the void. Um, it was, it could have been halfway through my experience for all I know. I, I had just slept through the first half. I'm not sure. And, uh, but uh, I just came to in that darkness, and I was surrounded by this unconditional love. And I, would, I was aware that the darkness, not really the darkness, but I'll get to that later, was aware of me as well. I wasn't alone. I was, the, the darkness felt like it was cradling me, like the mother would hold her child. And the mother doesn't look at her child, the perfect mother doesn't look at her child and see flaws. She just radiates it with love, and that's what I felt there. It was very a very maternal aspect of God, if you will. Um, that's the feminine aspect, it's the first part of my experience. And it's very <coughs> dualistic. Um, my, uh, my awareness was also not only on the other awareness that was there, but the fact that I knew things I shouldn't know or that I didn't know, I already knew. I, would, I, I realized there was an awareness there, so I thought to ask it a question, to speak to it. And as if the question came into my mind, I already knew the answer. And I never, there wasn't even a, a need for telepathy because I already knew everything that I ever wanted to know. It was just a matter of focusing on it. And as I wanted to know something, not only what I wanted to know came through, but the fully abridged version of it with references to how that one little piece of, of the answer was fitted into the rest of creation. Every part of reality fit perfectly together. Um, I felt connected to everything, even though I was completely in an empty space. Um, I had no point of reference to where everything that I knew was, but I knew that every part of creation was part of me as well. And that connection was uh, deeper than, and I, I likened it to a machine where each of us are cogs within a machine. And how the machine would never run perfectly without all of its cogs in place. And that sometimes comes off as kind of demeaning, okay, we're just cogs in a machine. But no, it's each, each part is integral to the entire whole. Each part is the whole. And um, the, uh, the, the, the parts in that darkness are so hard to explain um, of what I, I did know, because I've lost so much of it. Um, I think a lot of that information was just beyond what our physical, chemical, biological brains can hold. I, I don't think it, it, that information really fits within the three dimensions of our understanding of reality here. And so I just managed to pull through a little bit that I managed to, to glean onto. Um, okay, the cat's out of the bag. You know I'm not a public speaker. You're <laughs> fine. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the 
feeling that everything is important, everything is part of a greater whole, is something that I, I the words just fall. They, they don't encapsulate how important that is, that it's all one, and we're all part of that one. Um, that darkness that I was talking about was aware, but it was not a point of awareness, it was a field of awareness. It was the backdrop of reality. It was the essence. The darkness was just the color that was around me at the time. The, well, if you call it darkness a color. It, it, the darkness itself wasn't what was holding me. It wasn't what was cradling me. It wasn't what was loving me. And it wasn't the source of the information. It was that field of awareness. For lack of a better word, I'll call it God. Unfortunately, that comes with a lot of baggage because people have meaning behind that word. But um, that is the closest I can come to. It's a completely infinite in its vastness. Um, and yes, I often refer to it as it. Uh, it doesn't mind. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the information I had, the love, was just more than I could take in, like I said. But yet somehow it fit. But in some, for some reason, I felt like there should be something more. Perhaps it was my Catholic upbringing. Perhaps it was just expectations of what it was I was supposed to find, because I was realizing I am dead. And I was looking for an angel. I was looking for Jesus. I was looking for a form for that infinite love to take. And I didn't find anything. It was just a field. It was just open field, meaning like an electric field. It's not like a grassy field. Um, but uh, th it didn't take any form there. It was just its raw essence. It was just in its pure state. And um, I'll get to the possible meanings later, but the, uh, I, I kept feeling like there's some, there should be something more. Where is everything? I, I, can, I felt my connection to everything, everything, but I didn't know where it was, and I wanted to. And well, I wanted to see it with these new eyes that didn't exist. And the, <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of paradox involved in explaining an NDP, isn't there? <laughs> um, but I, I kept looking, I kept searching and feeling. And that point of awareness that I was, I wasn't an intelligence, I wasn't a, a person, so to speak, I wasn't a mind. It was just a point of awareness with a history and a personality. And as that point of awareness re reached out into the darkness, it was like an amoeba st st sending part of itself out. I wasn't actually seeing the darkness. I was experiencing it directly. Because there's no light, I can't see it. I can't experience it. But being a point of awareness, I would actually extend myself into that darkness. And so again, very hard to explain. But uh, like an amoeba standing out parts of myself out to infinity, I just kept going. And I kept feeling that this darkness was infinite and the, the field was infinite, but I never reached the end. And I'd research in all directions because, again, location was only where I was, but I was just at one point within a field. Um, and I kept trying to turn, but how do you turn when you don't have a front? Um, you don't have a top, you don't have a bottom, uh, left and right, and very little. Um, and, but I kept trying to shift, and I'm not sure what I did, but it was, I liken it to having one's head stuck in a vice, and using your eyes, darting back and forth, looking up and down, and not being able to turn your head, and then suddenly the vice is released, and my head shifted, and brought into a new perspective was the light. And everything shifted. I'm not sure if it was passing through one of those multiple dimensions that space had there. I said it's surreal. It's, <laughs> it's really hard to explain. But it, it, there was a shift. And I, I don't know if it was a, a, a change frequency or, or I tuned into another station, but suddenly there was something. There was a form. It was the light. And the light had structure to it. Um, the, the perfect purity of my experience, it ended at that point. 
I went into stage two, which I still, to this day, wish I was in stage one. Um, I still was in a dark place, and I still felt that infinite love from all directions all around me, and I still felt at home. I still felt like I belonged. But something else was there, the light. And the light was, whereas the darkness was very feminine, the light was very masculine. And the darkness shared the love, but the light shared glory. And the light that I saw was really hard to explain. The structure of it was like, if you've seen a pane of glass lit from the end, the entire pane glows. Um, if you take a point in space, and just call that the center, there's nothing there. But then you place panes of glass, infinite panes of glass, around that point where the panes would cross. They would, they would cross through one another, and there'd be a little streak of light, like the edge of that pane of glass, that always glows a little bit brighter than the pane itself. And, but that streak would go out to infinity because these were infinite panes of glass, um, hypothetically. Uh, and they all crossed about the same point, same distance away from the central point. So it, it had a glow to it that reached out to infinity, but, and that glow was also streaked through with these crystalline-like lines, these little ribbons of light that reached out to infinity. And I'm not sure if there's any meaning to the structure that it had, but it was very crystalline in nature. And it was, it, every pane was roughly the same distance from the center, and it felt so right, like it, almost familiar to me, but to this day, I don't know if I was looking at an electron up close, or if I was looking at the entirety of creation. I don't know if each of those panes was a different parallel universe. I don't know what the scale was. I didn't even have a body still. So it didn't mean anything to me how large this was. Um, within each of those panes, to make it even more complicated, <laughs> within each pane was little fireflies. They were, whereas the panes were glowing this milky, soothing white color, the, the little fireflies were rainbow. They were multiple different colors. They were all moving and swirling. The, the crystalline structure as a whole, those panes weren't moving relative to one another or toward, toward the center, but the little fireflies were dancing within those panes. And where the two panes would cross, where you'd have that little ribbon of light, the ones that were crossing on one side were mirrored on the other side. And it, I just saw like wheels within wheels. It was, it, there was a depth to the, to the structure, to the pattern, to the, to the plan of the whole dance. And it was happening on an infinite scale. And I'm not sure what that center was, and I don't know what the panes were, and I don't even know what the fireflies were, but it all seemed to, be familiar to me at that point. And whereas when I was in the darkness, I had all knowledge. I'd just think about something and I knew exactly not only what I wanted to know, but how it fit in with everything else. I couldn't I couldn't behold all of creation at the same time. I think only God could do that, but I felt how each part would fit in with the whole. And I knew so much. But when I was looking at that light, the only thing, the only thought that I could hold in my mind, if you will, was wow. It was just awe. And it was like time had again stopped. And I don't know how long I was looking at that light. But there was, uh, it was like I lost myself in that light. And uh, as I looked into it, I, I, what little essence of what I was, what, what had, had been kind of put on the shelf, because I was just beholding that light. That's all I was at that moment. The point of awareness with only one thing to be aware of. And uh, that's where the experience ended, because the next thing I knew, I felt like I was being pushed back. Some people talk about being pulled back into their body, but for me it was, a very distinct feeling of being caught up in a tide and being shoved back. And again, no communication with the light. Even the darkness, I never even had to ask a question. I, I still don't know to this day why I came back, 
but that feeling of being pushed back almost felt like rejection. And that's when I came back into my body, and the feeling of coming back into my body is something that I'll never forget, because it was the most horrible feeling I've ever had. Um, it felt like I was being shoved through a screen door without the screen door opening first. <laughs> it felt like I was being shoved through a sieve, like a meat grinder, and I was ripped into a million pieces and then shoved back into this other form on the other side. And that form was like a mason jar, like a jelly jar or a, or a mayonnaise jar. And it was cold, and it was hard, and it was in pain, and far too small to encapsulate what I had become there. And I felt like I was just crammed back in, and I had maybe <coughs> the little pieces were shoved back in too, or maybe I just, maybe that's where the information is that I lost. But uh, I didn't, I felt like myself when I was on the other side, but then suddenly I came back in what I'd already always thought was myself, and it was strange. I wasn't myself anymore. And, jumping again <laughs> back into the timeline as it actually <laughs> happened, that's when I came to in the uh, intensive care ward, and that's where I felt those feelings of loss, and the feelings of anger, and the feelings of betrayal, and I would had everything that I'd ever wanted in my life, and so much more, so much more that was beyond what I was aware of being possible in life, and it was taken away and not just removed from, from me, but taking a, a, a knife from a child, but I was pushed away from it, and I was pushed back into that body that was so racked with pain. Um, <coughs> that's the, the experience. sounds really mundane to go from that to talking about my recovery, so I don't think I should do that. In any case, I did, I did survive. <laughs> I don't want to have anybody in the dark there. <laughs> as far as I know, actually, I have a question. I've, I've wondered whether or not this is just some dream or something that I'm having. Um, I've, I've questioned it because after the experience, everything seems so two-dimensional. It seems so shallow. And even though when I came back, I felt like I had one foot in each world. I, I felt still connected to everything, but, and I knew where these things were now. Back when I was feeling connected to these things, I couldn't see where they were when I was dead. But now I was back in the flesh, I could see things, but I would feel that connection with them. Um, the, uh, uh, another thing about the darkness, when I was in that state, the, the, the feeling connect, connection to everything, and I also felt that feeling of love that was showering on me, and it wasn't indiscriminately radiating like the light from the sun, it was directed at me, it was personal. And it was a connection between me and that field. And when I would think about how I was connected to everything else, I would also feel how that love was radiating from that field to the rest of creation as well. And I realized what the meaning of unconditional love was. It wasn't just radiating out, we just had to go around and collect whatever it is we could get. It was directed at us personally. It's a personal relationship <coughs> with the universe, if you will, um, which has other connotations. Um, it's hard to name God, isn't it? <laughs> um, but uh, that feeling of, of being connected to everything and feeling that love direct, direct specifically at me, I also felt, from the field's perspective, sharing that love with all of the rest of creation. And I felt almost as though I was loving the entire universe by proxy. And I think it was a good experience for me coming back into this life because afterward I still feel a connection to everyone. Um, I'm, I'm still a bit of a a social dwarf, if you will. I still don't feel comfortable getting up here and talking, as I'm sure it comes across. But I still love everyone in creation, and I can't, I'm not comfortable with that feeling because of my previous life, um, 
before uh, Friday the 13th in October of 95. <laughs> but uh, the, uh, the, the sentiment is there, and I just, I'm fumbling with trying to come across and share that. And much like describing the light, it's so hard to describe that love. And I do my best, and I know it, it falls flat. <laughs> The uh, other effects, again, I had one foot in each world when I came back. I felt like I belonged there. I, I was standing on two feet. Most of my weight was on one foot. Unfortunately, that foot wasn't in this world. I felt like I was just kind of sort of here, but not really here. I don't feel like I'm actually in this world. I feel like I'm still there. Um, from that foot in that world, I started sensing spirits. and. It was actually kind of shocking when I first started seeing auras. Um, I, I thought it was uh, actually a, a problem with the medication I was on or something <laughs> because everything was fuzzy and I, I could still see clearly what was behind the blur, but I, I, it was, um, and the, I never actually saw colors, which is weird. I very rarely see colors, but it was just kind of a blur, a haze. It looks like the, the heat waves rising off the hood of a car on a hot day. I don't know if you have that here, but we do have that in California, we have hot days. Um, but yeah, you have that mirage look to it, and that's what I could see with the auras all of a sudden, and it didn't make sense. I, I thought there was something wrong again. Seeing things clearly can be kind of disturbing when you, when you don't know what clearly means. Um, it uh, also, after one of the after effects is that I, Sometimes, would, uh, actually all the time at first, would feel the emotions of people around me. Um, I'd be in a, a, a crowded room and I'd, I'd feel angry and I'd feel humor, I'd feel uh, love, I'd feel various emotions that, again, I was I started thinking I was going insane because it didn't make sense why I'm feeling two completely conflicting emotions at once. And it took me about three years before I realized I'm picking up other people's emotions. And uh, it became an empath, and it scared the heck out of me. I mean, I'm an introvert. <laughs> I don't deal, with, don't deal well with my own emotions before all this, and suddenly I'm getting broad spectrum reality. <laughs> and it was more than I could take in, and I eventually got to the point where I could turn it down and actually have trouble turning it back on sometimes. But uh, IONS groups are one place where I feel comfortable enough to be able to do that. Um, the after effects of the stabbing anyway, we'll go back to the physical, pay homage to the body. Um, it, uh, I, I had uh, a lot of recovery. The uh, nerve plexus in my shoulder caused permanent nerve damage and um, they, my chest was literally being held together with staples because they had to massage my heart to bring me back. Um, and uh, the, the body that I came back to was just riddled in pain, but yet, and all that anger and that feeling of, of betrayal and such, as in a, in, within those two seconds when I saw that light, it evaporated. That clarity came through with me at that moment. I had to actually understand where the pain came from, and once I understood that it was the loss of my NDE, there was the loss of being in that place, um, that was the cause of all that negativity, that once I realized that, it was like that negativity just evaporated in an instant. I, I liken it to dropping something into a blast furnace or dropping a block of ice into, into the sun, and it just evaporated, but not even leaving mist behind, and it was just gone, and I think it's because as I was re-experiencing that light, everything that I was, was gone. All that negativity evaporated with it. And I know I'm all over the field here. Um, in any case, that's, that's my, my experience and what led up to it, the after effects I'm still trying to deal with. Um, I don't have answers for anyone. I don't have my own answers. I can't get up here and, and say that I know anything. I mean, the wisdom of the fool might not set you free, 
it's less likely to enslave you than the wisdom of a, uh, of a learned man, but all I have to offer you is the wisdom of a fool. I don't know anything. I've been in a place where I did, and I've, I'm so aware of how much I've lost. The, uh, the, uh, uh, sorry. Uh, that's uncomfortable. I've been to such height. I've lost it. Six days later, I remembered it. I was in such pain. But yet, having just the memory of that was so pure and so beautiful that the pain became two-dimensional just by remembering it. Just the memory of that reality, that truth of what really is. Pain didn't mean anything in comparison afterward. I recovered. I forgave my brother because, well, first of all, I understood that the pain wasn't from my brother but also because I understood how much God loved him. I understood how much this shell that people had been talking to me as this shell for so many days wasn't really me. That schizophrenia that caused my brother to pick up that knife wasn't my brother. He was a different point of awareness that was seeing the world through a filter. He was seeing the world through a flawed lens, but it's not who he is. And so much of what we think we are, myself included, even now, um, is not who we are. We are something pure. We are something that is, we're all interconnected, and we're all part of a greater whole. And again, words are just going to fail. I can't explain it. I think I'm going to have to stop. <laughs> I think I've covered pretty much all of it. We'll go to questions and answers. And the first hand up. <laughs> so I know you uh, don't feel like you have any answers, but do you, did you, you know, get any revelations why it happened this way or why you were? you know, uh, stabbed by your brother, or, you know, did you get any uh, historical, universal historical context? Okay, to reiterate the question is, do I understand the big picture? Yeah. Do I understand <laughs> what the meaning of life is? Heck, heck no. I'm a bit of flotsam. I'm, I'm trying my best to go with the flow, to, to ride the wave, but I am not, I, I, completely given up on trying to direct it. I realize how futile that is, and even understanding it is beyond my human capacity to do. I hope that answers it. Yes. Some? Yeah. Second hand up, I believe. You know, you told as you told your story, I was reminded a lot of uh, the Fisher King story, uh, where uh, Percival comes on a spit, the uh, fish roasting on a spit, and he's hungry, and there's nobody in the camp. He takes a a piece of the fish and to, to eat, and he burns his fingers trying to pick up this fish and drops it on the ground and puts his fingers in his mouth to assuage the, the wound. And he gets a taste of the fish in his mouth. And that that's, leads him on this quest for the rest of his life of understanding. And, and I hear in your story a lot of that that search, and a lot of times these things happen as for the main reason that you're standing here now. You know, you wouldn't be standing here now if that thing hadn't happened. So I think it's it's a part of the journey. It's all part of the story that that maybe this is part of your journey in this life to stand right there. I think you're probably right. I, I God knows I'm not comfortable up here. But yet he keeps directing me to get up and talk to people. But I don't have any answers. I don't have any idea what I'm doing. And I guess the best message I can give you is that nobody does. People who claim to know the answer 
people who claim to, to have compacted the infinite mind of God within their small cranium <laughs> are either lying or insane. <laughs> it's so much bigger than that. And even when you do have a piece of the truth, it goes so much deeper and so much so far beyond that that the best we can do is, is just get a flavor for it. Get, get the, the basic hue of it, but we'll never embrace that color. We'll never embrace that on this side. But it's there. It's waiting for us there. And we will be back in unity, in, in unity with the whole. And it will be ours. I'm not sure. When people ask you questions, would you want to ask a question before? I'll try. <laughs> the Bishop King was kind of hard. Yeah, sorry, I, I weighed that one before I made the executive decision. <laughs> Question, it's a comment. I just wanted to let you know how deeply your descriptions touched me because the first description that you shared with us about being in this dark space, not being aware of your body, and yet feeling this feminine type love, I've never had a near death experience. But I had this unusual dream following the conclusion of a very painful employment. I'm a full-time professional nanny and house manager. And little did I know that the family that I was with at the time was deeply troubled. That came out during the course of employment. The mother discovered that her husband had been hiding chronic alcoholism from her and an addiction to uh, diet pills. And things became unraveled for the family after the birth of twin girls. They had already uh, had a three-year-old. And it was, it was a horrific experience for me because he had uh, what could be understood as a breakdown with the stresses of his uh, increased family. And he became verbally abusive toward me, paranoid. It was an awful situation. And the daily stresses toward the end actually created a serious physical illness within me. And when I left that family, I was, I was heart sick because I loved the children dearly. I was horribly angry without feeling like I could resolve it. I was grief stricken. I was frightened for them. And it was either the next day or very shortly afterwards that I had this dream and I've never had a dream similar to this. But it was so similar to yours that I felt that I just needed to share that with you. I dreamed that I was also in total blackness with no awareness of my body. And I couldn't see anything else. There were no words expo spoken, but I felt unseen hands and somehow I knew that they were removing shackles from my body and it was so it was so comforting when I awakened because I felt like some shackles had been removed and I still you know to this day am processing what happened with that family but I, I was so grateful when I awakened for that experience because I felt totally loved also. And I just wanted to let you know that in that respect, our two experiences were so similar. And there is that all-encompassing love there. And I don't have to repeat that, do I? <laughs> <laughs>
Um, it, it's wonderful how all experiences, all experiences are really one experience. We're all having the same experience. And the, the description you're giving with shackles being lifted off through that release, it's how the realization of how much we are Jacob Marley from A Christmas Carol, how we have these shackles on us that we put on ourselves. But unlike from The Christmas Carol, we have the choice to just let them go and to, to put them aside. And we can liberate ourselves. But it's up here, we are enslaved. We keep from feeling connected to each other because we want to have that separation. It's comfort. And we choose to judge others before they can judge us. And all these shackles that we put on ourselves are totally unnecessary and not natural. It's not who we're supposed to be. But yeah, it's, it's and your experience is very similar to mine. And, and, and I believe many others, the, the language changes, the words we use, probably better than mine, are things that we have a hard time mm -hmm seeing past, but there is one truth, there is one unity, there is one whole, there is one essence where everything fits. There is one home where I was so briefly once, and I felt like I was that cog in the machine that if I was removed, it wouldn't work the same way again. And I don't know why I came back, and I don't know why I went there in the first place, but I'm okay with it. I don't control it. And it's just a matter of trusting that there's a reason for it. And we just have to really let go of those shackles, and everything will work out as it's supposed to. Thank you. <laughs> the next, I'm, I'm sorry. You're next. <laughs> yes. Yes. Steve, I've got news for you. You are a public speaker. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, how long after your experience did it take for you to begin talking about it to others? And what was it that made you feel um, it was okay to do that? I think the question is, if I can paraphrase, what the heck got me up here to exactly. talk about this in the first place? Um, I actually was silent about it when I first had my experience. It was uh, a few days after I'd had it, that, or after I remembered it, I should say. Um, time has no meaning in NDEs in general. Mine is even harder to say because it actually happened in hindsight. Um, but it was a few days later that I tried sharing my experience with my family. and. The, the <coughs> dipping my toes in the water, I realized how cold the reaction was, and I withdrew. And it took me 11 years before I actually tried sharing it with someone else. Um, my family was, again, structured in their thinking, and my experience just didn't fit. And they didn't know how to catalog it. They didn't know which cubby to place that information in. So it just kind of fell on deaf ears. And it took me 11 years before I actually found um, IANS and uh, the local group that I go to in Orange County, uh, Southern California. And uh, I came there, and for the first time in a long time, I felt like I was almost home again. And I felt like there were people there that understood. As I was telling my story, and I looked out, and I saw people nodding when I was saying when I was saying things that didn't make sense to me. I mean, I, I was trying to find words for things, and they're just nodding because they're not listening to the words. The words were just getting in the way. And as I as I described things, they, they nodded in rec recognition, and they understood. And if there's any ND out, NDEs out there, I swear you really got to come to more meetings. <laughs> no, I'm sorry, the, the next. So I have two questions. I, I... Somehow, when you were in that dark void, you said that it had all the answers. So, how did you know that? I mean, did you ask some questions? I mean, or could you have asked questions while you were there? Would they have told you while you were there? Um, the, the question was, when I was in the dark void, how did I know that the darkness had all the answers? It was, okay, 
to be honest, I don't know that it had all the answers. But every single thing that I thought of, I felt mirrored in that darkness. Even about me personally, it knew everything about me. It knew things about me that to this day I don't know about myself. It was the Akashic record tied to the mind of God, tied to so many different understandings. I mean, that was the foundation of all knowledge was in that. And there were parts of it that reflected on me. And it, as I was thinking about the, the bad things I'd done in life, and I thought about all my shortcomings, and I thought about how I'd done wrong things. And again, I didn't have a life review where things were shown to me. But as I look back on them, having all this knowledge of even myself, that unconditional love stayed at that infinite level. There was no holding back considering any of these things that I'd done. It was just completely unconditional love. But the, the, the knowledge that I got just about myself, as I looked at that, it was kind of like looking in my friend's eyes, which triggered the experience to come back in the first place. I saw a reflection of myself. And as I knew these things, I also sensed that the that field, as I a mere point within that field, a single point of awareness within the field of awareness was aware of it. It was aware of so much more at all at the same time. And um, it's kind of a, a good portion of it is kind of an intuitive thing. I felt it, I, I knew it, but it, it wasn't anything that I can actually say this is the reason why I do that. Mm -hmm. And then also, what happened to your brother? Uh, the question is, what happened to my brother? Um, <laughs> he uh, wound up going to jail. Um, it took 13 months, and that's a whole other side story. I have threes and thirteens happening all over through my experience, and it just kind of leads me to believe there is a plan. Um, but uh, my brother went to the went to jail for 13 months, and when he came up to court, when his court date came around, um, his family got up including myself, and pleaded that he not be charged with the attempted murder that they were originally trying to charge him with. And uh, they actually, instead of putting him in prison for many, many years, they wound up putting him into a, uh, a hospital where he was, they made sure that he was taking his medication. And uh, when they finally got the balance right, he was willing to stay on it. And um, we still have holidays together. I see him maybe once a month, and it's, it, it, it's, I can't say it's like it never happened. <laughs> my entire family, I think that's part of the reason why my family couldn't really accept it, was because when I look back on that day, I see the beauty and the wonder and, and the, the understanding and the love. And when they look back on that day, they see the blood and they see the pain and they see my brother being sent off to, to jail and they see me dying. And they couldn't understand how I saw the entire thing as beautiful. And even now, even with all the pain that happened, I see the entirety of it as beautiful. Um, I'm sorry. You. Sorry. Um, uh, no, no. <laughs> the woman in the scarf. I just wondered how you've reintegrated. Do you have like a regular job or what do you do? Well, the question is how, how I've reintegrated right. and whether or not I have a regular job. <laughs> um, I have a really boring job, actually. Uh -huh. The integration still hasn't come. I, perhaps because I'm dyslexic and I have a learning disability and I don't pick up th on things quite as quickly as, as some, it, seven years wasn't enough for me. I mean, uh, I'm on year 14. I'm 14 years old, by the way, as of October. Um, I started over. Um, that's how I explain the acne. Um, <laughs> the uh, throat's closing up. But uh, the, as far as the job goes, I. I was in retail at the time. That was my when I had my day off and I had my experience. Um, and uh, after that, I stuck it out for a little while longer. I didn't see how jobs were important mm -hmm. in, in the wider field of things. <laughs> and uh, so I, I stuck it out, just kind of survival. And uh, after a while, I wound up going back to school and uh, taking some drafting courses. And I wound up becoming a drafter, uh, partly because of my understanding of space. 
not higher dimension. Uh, I can see things in my head now, whereas before it was kind of drafters tend to see things in three two-dimensional pictures of something seen from different sides. For me, I can see it all in three dimensions all at the same time. So I figured, hey, maybe I should use this. So I wound up becoming a drafter, and well, now I'm out of work, as are the times. I'm sorry, who was next? Hi. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm going with the hand I see first. My question is, did you, uh, did you have chance to talk to your brother about this and the thing that happened, and uh, what was his explanation? Uh, the question is whether or not I had a chance to talk to my brother and what was his explanation. I'm assuming you're referring to as for the reason for the stabbing. Um, I did have a chance to talk to my brother as well as I heard from various sources including my mother about what he was telling the police as well. And the stories varied. Um, schizophrenia is such that whereas all of us have a very dim view of reality. We all can't make out the definition of what's really there. Schizophrenics are seeing it through a, a shattered lens as opposed to just a hazy one. Um, his view changed. Uh, when he was originally picked up by the police, uh, he was explaining to them, because at the time my father was ill, he was explaining to them that I had cast a spell on my father and that by attacking me, he wasn't attacking me, he was attacking the spell. So that was one version, and I, I think there were actually a total of three different versions, but that's an example of what he was actually telling the police. Um, in any case, it was completely detached from what was actually happening, and uh, it's, that was his reality. And we all share our reality, but we never have it from the same view, and his was just a little bit further outside the norm. It means he was aware that he was trying to kill somebody. Uh, he was not pushed by any other force, yes? Um, whether or not he was... Uh, aware. External force, like a demon or something. Okay. Uh, whether or not he was aware that he was attacking somebody and whether or not it was from an external force. He was... He, he from the time, was saying that he was willfully attacking something. But he didn't, from what he told the police, was that it was a spell that he was trying to break. He didn't see it as he was attacking a human being. So, um, yes and no. Uh, he, he saw it. He, he was the one in charge. He, it wasn't a demon involved. Uh, it was him making that choice to do that. But he didn't believe he was attacking a person. Okay. You on the aisle. First of all, I agree. You're you are a good speaker, so don't feel bad about that. Um, you said that when you were in the dark space, that you felt this immense, all-encompassing uh, love, and that we were all connected. When you came back into your body and you're functioning in this world, can you um, do you connect that? With the way you look at people, are you able to like feel love for everyone because you feel this connection, or is this world sort of a filtering where it stops what you went through to come through? Okay, the question is whether or not I still feel the connection that I felt during my experience, and whether or not I still feel that love for everything. For everybody. And everything and everybody. Uh, the answer is yes. I still feel it. I still feel that connection. I'm still. I still have bad days. I still have frustration sometimes dealing with traffic and, and other things of the moment that distract us from that. But even so, in the background, it's always there. I'm aware now that that love that's radiating from that field, from that, from that, uh, from God, is always there, even if we're not aware of it. And. Uh, it, it doesn't let up. It's, I believe, the reason is, is the thing that's holding up reality, if you will. If that were to stop, I don't think anything would, everything would evaporate like those negative feelings when I saw that light in the first place. It would just be gone. I think that we are being sustained by that love. We were created from it. And it is who we are, not just what we were made from, but it's what keeps us going. In the back, I'm, I'm neglecting the back. Uh, you know, it's, it's, 
this lady just kind of asked my question, you know, I was basically, like you said, when you went to the other side, you know, you said that everything, when you saw the light, everything was smashed like dropping an ice cube onto the sun, and all was forgiven, and you felt perfect, you know, love, which is what, you know, sometimes people explain God as, is a perfect love, infinite perfect love. And uh, yeah, I was going to say, when you came back to this side, you said you were leaning towards the other side, but you felt yourself, you know, stuffed into a mason jar, and, you know, you said you still have your bad days. I was going to say, you know, is it a struggle with your ego? Do you form resentments against others, or, you know, like you said, you you have your bad days? I mean, do you still get angry with people and form <coughs> resentments, or has this experience, like, connected you and help you, you know, sustain you. Okay, but the question is how, regarding the change afterward, do I still have that, those feelings of, of anger, and um, do I still feel like I'm still standing mostly in that world? Um, I feel almost as though that part, most of me is still there. I, the, the vast majority of what I am isn't here. This is not who I am. These are just the atoms that I'm maintaining for the time being. They're on loan to me. It's not who I am. Um, I don't feel angry, actually, with people. I get frustrated with them. And it's kind of like uh, a child who is throwing a tantrum will frustrate a parent, but you don't... It, it's with the feeling of love that's still there, it's hard to dismiss the love in favor of anger. So I get frustrated with people sometimes when I see them doing things that are self-destructive or doing things that are hurtful to others intentionally. Um, and uh, I, I see that as, as very childish, but it's only appropriate because we're all children of God and we're all one family. And some of us who are acting out are dealing with their own fears and their own, uh, their own issues and we need to overlook that and try to support one another as best we can. And uh, those, I, 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 maybe it's a touch of hubris, but I, I, I liken myself merely being a slightly older sibling in situations like that who's looking after my younger sibling who is acting out and trying to um, support them and nurture them, but it can still frustrate, yeah. <laughs> um, in the back of the orange top. Do um, you said you see auras, but not in color of the people? Are they different for different people? Do you have interpretations of that person's having good energy or a good day or good health or any any differences between them? Okay, on the subject of auras, whether or not I see differences, being I don't see color. Um, there have actually been a few times where I have seen color, but it's usually in it's almost like uh, my eyes aren't focusing on it, and I see it out of the the corner of my eye, and it's usually in very intensely emotional states that I can actually see it, but it's very rare. Um, but yeah, I do see differences in them. Um, those waves that are rising off the hood of a car on some days might seem like they're four inches tall, and other times they're tightly, they're, they're held closer to the vest. I can, I can kind of gauge the, the thickness of it and the density of it. Just by seeing. Do you have meaning or interpretations for those things? It's usually how guarded the person is, is how, how dense it is and how, how compact the, the feeling that, that I get from it is, is just how restricted, how open they are to approach you, basically. Um, but uh, no, I don't get, I didn't like to say, unless it's the extremely intense emotion, I don't usually see color and I don't usually get much of a reading, if you will. Um, my eyes focus on you next. <laughs> uh, is there anything more you can add about the shattered lens that someone who's schizophrenic like your brother is looking through, and how does that happen, and is there a way to shift it, and how does medication affect that? Okay, on the subject of the, the shattered lens of schizophrenia, um, and my interpretation of that, first of all, let me take a step back and say, so much of what it is I got doesn't even make sense to my own brain. It's really hard to explain. So I use metaphor a lot to try to explain it. I can't explain what something is like, but I can s explain what something is like. 
um, I can, with the lens, I see how people see the world differently. People have their own views of things, and we're all observing something outside of ourselves. And as we observe this, we put our own color, our own spin on it. Um, and uh, it's like we, we're filtering it. We're only taking in what we're comfortable with. And uh, reality as a whole, as well as even the concept of God with religion, everybody's viewing it. And they're all focusing on differences. They're always focusing on the differences. But the differences are only in our own lens. God is God. And if we see differences, and if we focus on the differences, how one person believes something different than what we believe, we're focusing just on our own lens. But if we look at the common commonalities, we look at what's similar, we're actually seeing something beyond our lens. Um, schizophrenics are, are, again, there's some that are high functioning and some that are lower, but they're dealing with a different kind of flaw in that lens. It's not who they are. Um, and I can't say that it's, it's any less accurate than mine. I, I don't have the hubris of understanding what's real and what's not, but uh, it's it's not something that they should be judged for or condemned for. It's not it's not who they are. It's just they're, it's what they're dealing with in this life. your coming and sharing with us. It was a great afternoon and we'll remember it, I'm sure, for a long time. Thank you. So everybody, don't forget Chris Markey next month. Uh, it will be a great meeting too. And we are going to release this afternoon or this evening for dinner if you want to join us. So we'll see you there. Don't forget your trash. Thank you.